I mean, think about it. If you're like a craft distiller, you work your ass off, like making something. <laughs> yeah. And all anyone ever asks is like, was it, did you distill it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we produced it. No. Did you distill it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right there on the label. I, I mean, I did it all my own. And then, and then they, then you taste it like, oh, that sucks. I'd rather have MGP, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. It is episode 229 of Bourbon Pursuit, and I hope you're out there drinking a little bit of turkey today and just taking it nice and easy. Now, Buffalo Trace just wrapped up its second experiment utilizing its custom-made Experimental Warehouse X. Now, this experiment began in 2016 and focused on how temperature affects the aging process. The first experiment ended in 2016, and that one focused on natural light keeping barrels in various stages of light for two years. And this second experiment, which just ended a few weeks ago at the end of October, determined how barrel activity correlates with temperature changes, keeping two of the four warehouse chambers constant and varying the other two chambers. And throughout the experiment, they tracked temperature fluctuations from 5 degrees to 109 degrees Fahrenheit and monitored the barrel pressures ranging from about negative 2.7 PSI to a positive 3.2 PSI. In total, 9.1 million data points were collected during the second experiment. And now the next experiment will expand on the distillery's temperature experiment by focusing on how temperature and these swings affect whiskey activity in the barrel. And there's going to be a two-year experiment, and that's going to begin in late November. Buffalo Trace estimates that it's going to collect more than 70 million data points by the end of this 20-year project. For more information about Warehouse X, you can visit experimentalwarehouse.com. Good friend of the show, Marianne Eves, got a chance to tell her story on nothing else but the TED stage. TED Talks are a personal favorite of mine, and I feel that she did an absolute amazing job on this. Not only do you get to hear her story of getting into bourbon, working her way up the ranks at Brown Foreman, to leave for Castle and Key, and her eventual departure from Castle and Key, but she really shines a spotlight on bourbon as a whole. It's a 10-minute TED Talk that was from TEDx Broadway, and you can watch it with the link in our show notes. This is the final roundtable for 2019 as we head into the new year, and this one, it packs a few punches. We first dive into the Instagram news, where the number of likes are now hidden from your view, and if that's going to impact our bourbon Instagram stars that are out there. Then we roll into the real meat of the podcast, talking about Pappy and Sazerac versus the secondary market. There's lots of good ideas and theories behind this one. Lastly, we share what we're thankful for in 2019. And I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you to you. We really do appreciate the hours that you spend with us every single week to hear us talk about bourbon. And I hope each and every one of you have a happy Thanksgiving. Now it's time for Joe to tell us a little bit more about Barrel Bourbon. And then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. It's Joe from Barrel Bourbon. We work with distilleries from all over the world to source and blend the best ingredients into America's most curious cask-strength whiskeys. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Ian that Bourbon Guy on Twitter. Ian asks, what are the top 10 vintage bourbons everyone must chase on their whiskey journey? That's a great question, and it's one I've actually thought a lot about because I like to collect vintage whiskeys. For me, it all starts with the distilleries. You want to have like a whiskey from every distillery that matters to you or every state. For me, I can't speak for everyone else, but I had to have some uh, Mexican bourbon and some Canadian bourbon in my collection. So when I started my hunts, uh, I captured some of, of those. That, so these are historic bourbons that would have been made in these markets uh, before the 1964 Declaration of Bourbon being a unique product in the United States. So those are two right off the bat. And the Mexican bourbon was not so good. The Canadian bourbon, actually, pretty, pretty good. Uh, and then I have to always have uh, something from National Distillers. National Distillers was this really good uh, parent company that used to operate Old Taylor and Old Crow. They sold to uh, Beam in 1987. And uh, Old Crow turned to shit. And thankfully, Sazerac acquired Old Taylor from Beam, 
which was slowly going to shit as well. So I always have to have something from National uh, Distillers. And then I like to go for uh, my favorite distillers of all time, and that would be someone like Edwin Foote or Booker No or Lincoln Henderson or Parker Beam. You know, something that these great, legendary, iconic distillers would have touched. So that's not really a brand per se, but you got to do your homework to find out where they worked and what they did and what brands they touched. Uh, and that, and so that is that is one tool that I have always used as well. And you got to get something from the 1800s. I mean, it's kind of a, um, it's a difficult acquisition, but if you can find an old bottle from the 1800s, you feel pretty special about it. It's a pretty, pretty cool feeling when you hold in your hand something that was created during President Benjamin Harrison's time. I also like to always have a bottle from Stitzel Weller. Wild Turkey, old Brown Foreman products like old Old Forster from the 1960s, the President's Choice, and something I'm very fond of, that's getting those private labels that they used to make. Back in the day, places like uh, Macy's and grocery stores, they would all have private labels of bourbon. You're starting to see a little bit of a comeback of this, but it was really popular back in the day. One thing I like to stay away from, though, are the decanters, especially the Jim Beam decanters. Because you really never know how much is left in there. You know, some of them, there might be like too much lead in there or whatever. But there's a lot of decanters uh, that I will not touch. Of course, that completely uh, contradicts what I'm about to tell you. And that is the Old Crow Chessman piece from the 1960s. It was absolutely, it's absolutely the greatest bourbon I have ever tasted. And if you've never had the opportunity to taste it, you can go check out a bottle at the Bardstown Bourbon Company, the library there I curated. So those are really some of my key points when I'm when I'm looking for vintage whiskeys, and they're all very personal. You got to remember, whiskey is is about your own journey as well as the hunt. So find out what it is you like and what stories mean something to you and what people meant something to you, and go chase them. So that's this week's Above the Char. Thanks a lot to Ian for that great idea. And if you have an idea for Above the Char, make sure you hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, uh, or even YouTube now. Just search my name, Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome, everybody. It is the Bourbon Community Roundtable number 39, and this is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. This is one of the most favorite times of the podcast, especially for us, because we get to bring on all our good friends with inside of the uh, the community here, the best bloggers around, uh, some of the best lawyers around that know about bourbon as well. And, and, account- you know, and accountants. <laughs> I mean, we got two accountants. Yeah, we got all, we're going we're gonna to start creating our own trade business at the end of this. And, and not only that is, you know, we have uh, people from all around the nation that are joining and uh, watching us live and being able to part of this conversation as well. Uh, right now, we're sitting around 63 concurrent viewers. Hopefully, we'll get to 100 by the end of this. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead because we've got a, a, a whole lot of information to talk about, and I want to kind of get into this. So, uh, Ryan, Fred, here we are again, man. You guys look looking forward to tonight? Yeah, I think this is a very important uh, discussion to have tonight. and. I think it's one we've all wanted to have. What are we discussing? <laughs> <laughs> no. That's what happens. That's what happens when you don't do the homework. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to discuss that too. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, round in our first one. So Blake from Bourbon, how are you, Blam? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, into my introduction. Yeah, I guess. Okay. You know, let's just do our usual thing. All right, do the usual. All right, I'm Blake from Bourboner. Um, if you're watching this, you probably uh, already know this is the you know longest standing tradition of making the roundtables. They like to call me the Ken, Ka- the Ken Ripke, <laughs> <laughs> Ken Griffey, <Jr. laughs> the Ken Griffey, also Cal Ripken of the roundtable. But that's uh, you can follow me on all the social medias, b o u r b o n r dot com, as well as sealbox dot com. Only have URLs where you have to spell it out, and people are like, "Hold on, what was that again?" So sealbox is s e e l b a c h s. And you got a new uh, one, right? Southern Bourboner. And I have that one. I don't know. Is that <laughs> is that yours? Dang, bringing no, up our region. So. No. Is there a Southern Bourboner out there? Yeah. Yeah. Someone's oh, copying you. 
Uh-oh. We need to talk, Blake. Better hop on those URLs, Blake. Uh-oh, yeah. <laughs> Ryan, go ahead and put that cease and desist out. Yeah, I'll get it together tonight. <laughs> you, know, you know, speaking of that, the kind of fakes and stuff that would come out there, you might remember Ted Finnick? Remember those articles? Yeah. Yeah, that was Whatever brief. happened? He had like a solid two-month run, and then all of a sudden... It happens every now and then. Someone will come out and try to... Uh, you know, impersonate me or do some kind of, you know, fun satirical deal. And that's great. I love it. But what they don't realize is if you're going to try to impersonate me, you better try to keep up because <laughs> I go fast and do a lot. Become, they, they realize like, oh man, this, this is work now. Like yeah. <laughs> I could actually keep up in. with this. Yeah. I'll just go back to making fun of them in uh, in a Facebook forum, you know, and that's good. <laughs> All right, Brian, you're up next, buddy. Yeah, thanks guys for having me again. This is Brian with Sippin' Corn. You can find me on the all the socials at Sippin' Corn, and you can also find me at bourbonjustice.com. I uh, look forward to a good show tonight, guys. Fantastic. And Nick. Hey, and I'm Nick with breakingbourbon.com. Uh, April 1st, uh, breakingvodka.com. That's been known to happen, uh, but uh, only that one day. And uh, you can find us on all the socials at Breaking Bourbon. And uh, thanks again for having me on, guys. Absolutely. It's always great to have all of you on, especially everybody else that's here in the chat. So let's go ahead and kind of start with our first question. If people in the chat, they have something that they'd like to say with this as well, speak now, uh, because we'd like to be able to put it out there for you. So the first we're going to talk about is the new change that happened with Instagram. Now, this is something that uh, it kind of, you know, maybe it impacts the bourbon world a little bit, but more or less just like the influencer market that's out there. So one of the recent changes that happened was they had removed the ability to see the amount of likes that an individual has on a specific kind of post. And this could be for a few different reasons. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, you can buy likes out there. That's that's not unheard of. You can buy followers as well. But one thing you really can't buy are, uh, you know, good comments or engagement and stuff like that. So I guess the the one thing I'll kind of hand it over to uh, let's start. Who who has the the most followers? I'm, it's either between Bourbon or Breaking. Who's got the most followers? I think breaking over here? probably. Breaking. Yeah, I have to check. I think we're just under seventy thousand. Yeah. Uh, okay, you win. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have seventy. <laughs> just seventy. Just seventy. Yeah. There's there's no thousand after it. You'll get. Yeah. There. I mean, and I'll I'll say this. You know, our. our it's all 100% organic. We we've never gotten into you know anything where you sign up to get followers in some way. We pretty much just post what we want to talk about, what we're drinking. Uh, we we try to keep it light on there as much as possible. Of course, we'll we'll post new content and that kind of thing. Um, but we've really made that clear with you know anybody who wants to um, you know be sponsored in some way that you know really it's about what we want to do. So sure, if you want to send us a sample of something or a bottle that's fantastic, you know, we'll maybe review it, maybe do a TNT, you know, maybe it'll show up on Instagram, but really we still, you know, maintain and, and control that, um, you know, from the, the like perspective, you know, we certainly use that as a gauge as to what, you know, what people want to see, you know, what, um, you know, what times of week or times of day, you know, maybe the, the times when more people are going to see those posts, you know, generally speaking, you know, number of likes, you know, you'll, you'll gauge that as kind of the, the, uh, the, you know, that metric outside of um, kind of next, next met metric, which is the interaction. So the, the number of comments on the post, um, which is, you know, some posts we see a, a huge volume of comments and others, you know, not really much. I think sometimes when we direct people off to the site, we actually lose comments on um, the Instagram post itself and, and people are getting pulled right off to the site to read the review. But that's the intent. You know, the idea is to kind of share that message, to let people know there's something new um, up on this site. You know, what I think is interesting about this whole thing is it's being proposed as, and maybe there's some truth and validity to it that, uh, you know, it's to help with people's mental well-being, that kind of thing. Um, but that being said, I think there's a part of me that believes at some point, you know, these companies that want this data on, um, you know, on likes are going to be able to buy it on the back end. They're going to be able to see that data, you know, through some kind of payment to Instagram. They're going to be able to figure out, you know, who the best engaging uh, influencers are, if that's what you want to call them. And they're going to use that as a metric because right now, if you think of these, you know, these companies, if they're looking mm -hmm. at, you know, number of followers and they're looking at number of likes, those are really kind of just surface. It just touches the surface of what's going on, you know, as far as the interaction goes. And they really want the interactions. They want people that are interacting with the community and, and in depth and really, you know, connected with the communities that they're talking to. And those couple of metrics, I'm not really sure, you know, fully you know, fully show that. So I think what we're going to see is I think we're going to see Instagram 
really starting to take a, a bite out of this pie of, you know, these influencers who are making money on this, I think they want their piece. And I think that's what's eventually going to come is, you know, ways for those companies to kind of engage that data. Oh, Nick, that's a oh, fantastic great. answer, by the way. Yeah. Next subject. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever gauge uh, your post between you and Jordan and uh, just to see who has the most likes? I, th- I think Jordan does. I, he's, he's keeping track. But honestly, I, not really. Uh, we have, I mean, we have fun with it. We're, you know, running we, scoreboard in, in their <laughs> living rooms. <of> life. <laughs> we do get excited. I will say when there's, uh, uh, actually when there's comments is when we really get excited. Um, I think I posted, actually it was the, the three of us together. We went to a local store and he kind of let us in the back where he's got way too much that's not like generally for sale. Uh, but uh, he kind of said, you know, take what you want, you know, what do you want? And, you know, we, we weren't, we didn't go overboard, but we each got three bottles of stuff you just don't see. And, um, you know, we kind of put them, arranged them in groups of, well, this is what each of us got, you know, my group, Jordan's group, Eric's group. And we just said, which, which one would you pick one, two or three? And we were amazed by how many comments we got on that, you know, cause it's inter- interesting to see, you know, that dynamic of what people gravitated towards, you know, with the bundle or the one particular bottle, they felt like it was the strongest, you know, that kind of thing. So we get more excited about, uh, I think, interactions than just just plain old likes at this point. Yeah. And I kind of another question for, you know, between you and Blake, you know, when you look at this, you know, the ultimate goal is that none of us are like making money off Instagram, right? None of us are. Uh, I guess the, the question is, is that what we want to do is want to figure out how do we convert these people that are looking at our stuff on Instagram to actually listening to a podcast or reading one of your articles? Like, do you see Instagram as a medium to actually make that happen? Or just are people just excited to just be like, oh, cool. Nick has a bottle of Pappy 20. I'll like that. For me, I think it's just, you know, it's all a part of the big, the big flywheel. So, you know, there's, there's people who, come to just see the Instagram and may see a blog post or, or something like that. And, you know, so it's kind of connecting it all. Um, but I think Instagram is a good discovery tool. So uh, somebody may not be just Google searching and find you, but they may see you on Instagram. And they're like, oh, they have a blog. They posted a review. Now I'll look at that. Um, so I think it's, it's really good for that, just for d- discovering new uh, new blogs, new new uh, websites, all that kind of stuff. So it's not as big of on the likes. Like I, I didn't think that was that big of a deal, at least in the whiskey industry. Um, you know, I, I think Mikey put in the comments about you, you can still see the inside. So if companies want to see your analytics of how many likes and comments you get per post, they can still see all that. It's more of like that forward facing, just that vanity number of oh, this post got. 1000 likes. It is crazy. I think they just took, took away that. And I mean, that's fine to me. I don't think it really affects anything that us do. Cause you know, like Kenny said, no, no one's really making money off of Instagram. At least um, I haven't figured out a way yet. So, you know, it kind of re- removes that a little, removes a little bit of the vanity. Um, and so I think it's a pretty good thing overall. I think this is very important for the consumer. What, what this does is it kind of it kind of deflates uh, a trend that we've seen in in uh, whiskey in that there's been a shit ton of people who bought a bottle of bourbon five weeks ago and suddenly they're an expert. And so, <laughs> um, you know, it, Instagram seemed to be a breeding ground for people coming into the game. And I, as you all know, I will help anybody trying to get into this business, uh, you know, to, to create interesting content or ideas or videos, whatever. Um, I am all about furthering the education and the conversation. And even if you are a new bourbon consumer and you're bringing people into that journey uh, and you're just posting a bottle, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the problem that has surfaced from these, uh, you know, some of the, what we would call influencers is that they were like overnight, um, experts and they would, they would pose themselves as that. I mean, and someone like, uh, you know, Brian or myself who has been doing this for more than a decade. You know, you just kind of, kind of look at that and you scratch your head. Um, but at the same time, I have seen the impact of what the influencer community can do for, for events and getting people to show up or even watch something. And I think it's really powerful. There's a guy, uh, Scotch and Time. Uh, I thought 
I thought what he has done has been really uh, remarkable in that he kind of vetted a lot of uh, influencers that would touch scotch, whether they were cigars or uh, or they were car people. And like with it, you know, with a, f- a flick of a finger or, or a, a, a reach out through Instagram, he would have all those people talking about an event. And before you know it, you know, he touches a million people. And those are real people. And so I think there's an incredible amount of value to it. But we just have to be careful that we don't get ourselves in a situation where we're not providing real information or a real story that matters to somebody. Kind of just to back up what Fred says, I think I love Instagram and I, I waste countless hours of it. That's why I mostly <laughs> delete social media during the week, not to waste time on it. But uh, with Instagram, it's like you have shallow, short, and like, you know, what content's going to grab you at that instant. And it's like everything has to be epic and it makes it like so like dramatic. And it's sad that we have to like remove likes because people put so much self-worth like in those that we're trying to fix, uh, you know, people's mental health because they don't realize this is a highlight reel of someone's life or their life. Like when Blake's, you know, dropping a brisket and it wobbles and he has to put, you know, juvenile 400 degrees on it. Uh, <laughs> it's not because he's living this epic life. But he has kids screaming in the background. There's kids screaming in the background. <laughs> like everybody's going crazy. That's why I have to put music over every single Instagram. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, I, I, I hope it does like, for point, instance, reduce like those <laughs> celebrities or like, look at me. I'm so epic because I'm with my boys and we got like 10 bottles and we put like 40 filters on it to make it look like the craziest photo ever. But, uh, you know, that's just my thought on it. I will say that when I got, uh, when Instagram verified my account and I got that little blue check mark, I mean, there's, there are a few things that I have celebrated uh, more than that. That was like, uh, in a weird way, it was like, you know, for, it was like, few I things? Got, let me interrupt. Few things you've celebrated more than that. Well, in terms of like social media, I was about to go down go down that road. Like I I I hate social media, but when I first started like trying to uh, you know, sell books to publishers, they were like, You need Instagram followers, you need Twitter followers, you need this, and now it's fucking YouTube. So, you know, you have to have all of these things to be encompassing. And so that's why, you know, I've worked on that is because it it's what the people who, you know, put on events and you know, buy books at the publishing level or films or whatever, that's what they want. And at Bourbon and Beyond, you know, we assess uh, bands based on, you know, like a a new up and coming band. We can assess a band based on uh, the metrics from YouTube or Instagram. That's real life data. So when I got that like blue check mark, because I know how important that is uh, for like uh, event planners. And that's basically how I make a good chunk of my living is doing events around the world. And when I got that blue check mark, I was like, I've made it. <laughs> I've made it. <laughs> I had no idea. I was, that's crazy. I mean, I was late to the game, didn't get on until my daughter got me on. And uh, it's, it's eye opening to, to actually just put a green check after my name. I think it's something similar to that, similar <laughs> to the blue check. I think it will. Uh, the green check emoji. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty close. I think it'll pass in some places. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, I think that was a really good kind of like way to touch on it a little bit. And, and I guess the last thing that we'll kind of look in here is, you know, as if you're a company and you're still looking for that engagement and that influencer following, I mean, is this going to be a deterrent for you uh, not being able to see that? Or is it going to be like, okay, now we have to get more data out of this person, try to figure out if they're actually a true influencer or not. I think it's going to cause the companies to dig deeper. Well, you know, aren't there I, sites I, that give you those analytics? I mean, there's sites that like, you know, doing run it down follower yeah. by user. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By account. And, and I think, in, I think Instagram's going to use that data. You know, I think they're going to collect more data. I, I would think that they at some point are going to so. try to be in between. Cause if you think right now, if there's transactions happening between companies and between influencers, you got to, and it's happening outside of Instagram, but then the post and the activity, the thing that they want is happening inside of Instagram. I got to believe that if I'm Instagram, why wouldn't I want a portion of that? Why wouldn't I want to be the one to connect those two entities? And if anything, we may see a lot more of that because right now it's really pretty ad hoc. 
you know, especially if you're not somebody that's, you know, a, a huge Instagram personality that's got it figured out, you know, or a big company that's got it figured out. You know, you've got smaller companies seeing it, seeing likes, seeing followers, thinking, okay, there's a big audience here. Maybe they don't understand it, but they might want to throw some money. They may not know how to connect with, call it the, the influencer. So I think we may see a lot more connectivity there, you know, between between these two parties with Instagram actually in the middle, taking a portion of it, which to me, that's even a little bit more scary, you know, because as of right now, you got to be cautious about what you're seeing and reading because what's really, what's really behind it, you know, and there's certainly some markets out there where just about all the information that's out there is, is got somebody's money behind it. And it's very difficult to find real information, you know, that somebody has put together on their own without the influence from somebody's money. Okay. Last question. As we kind of tail off on this, should Instagram also hide the amount of followers that you have? I think that would um, start to deter even more from people reaching out to, you know, influencers and all that kind of stuff. So I think that would hurt their, you know, they can kind of get away with hiding the likes and, you know, gets a nice PR push. But if they started hiding followers and all of that, um, I mean, you know, the whole mental health thing I get, but it's like, if somebody is drawing value in their own life because of how many Instagram followers they have, um, Instagram's not going to be able to solve that problem in their life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to take something mm-hmm. more and, you know, it's a sad thing to say, but it is true. Um, like if that's where you're deriving value from w- w- with your life, like, you need to take a step back in general. And that's just a small byproduct of I'm sure some deep seated issues. Um, so kind of a, on a serious note to bring it back. Um, no, like what's the point? I mean, you know, we're all on there to build a bigger following and reach a bigger audience. So, um, take it for what it is. It's a tool to talk to more people about whiskey. It's not something that you should, be waking up in the middle of the night thinking, why don't I have a hundred thousand followers? Or <laughs> every time I, my posts don't get as much likes as Kenny's, I, I'm like in a deep, <laughs> you're in a funk. Several days. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. You know, I, who cares what they do? I mean, I just all, I mean, every, every day they're all changing their algorithms and you know, one day it's all going to go away or be changed and highly regulated. Just, uh, it's not worth worrying about or even thinking about. It's it's all stupid. Yeah, like speaking of stupid, let's go ahead and move on to another stupid topic. Does that sound fun? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah, cool. So last week, uh, Blake broke a lot of hearts out there across the nation as he got rid of, you know, he always has the BTAC map, but he said this year and never again will there ever be another Pappy release map. And so that kind of led into uh, a, a good blog post that kind of talked about really the problems that he sees with it. Um, you know, even if you do find a bottle of Pappy, odds are you're not going to be paying retail because I think he said there is about a, maybe a two to five percent chance that there's that's all the retailers that are left across the nation that are actually selling theirs at, at suggested resale price. And so this kind of leads into the the sort of the next question, and it also kind of tails off on a lot of things that we had discussed or kind of took the, the, the brunt end of it uh, a few weeks ago when we had a counterfeiter on the podcast and people were talking about, okay, well, you need to go talk to Sazerac. You need to pull, you need to put them on the line. They should be responsible for this. Like they need to answer the questions of the people. We, we reached out to Sazerac and PR and we asked for somebody to come on the show to try it and provide some transparency. And we knew this was going to be a sensitive subject and we we're willing to give all the questions up front just in case they wanted to prepare their answers. However, Sazerac, they respectfully declined our offer and they do not wish to answer any of our questions. So we're going to do what we do best and make all sorts of frivolous claims and conspiracy <laughs> theories. Speculations. Yes. So anything you hear from this point I, forward. I that mute button right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead and throw that Brian's way. Yeah. <laughs> So anything that you hear from here on out is our own opinions, uh, nothing that is uh, factual or true or anything. This is just something uh, that we're all just kind of talking about as just kind of friends and kind of just putting our ideas out there. So uh, the first thing we would kind of look at here is, of course, we all know that the Van Winkles were kind of the face of the secondary market takedown. We, we talked about it, you know, we recorded it at Bourbon and Beyond, we put it out there, the whole world got to hear it. However, I kind of want to put it out there for you all do you all believe that there are 
you know, there are bigger wheels in motion behind this. And it's actually Sazerac as a whole. And it's really the Van Winkles just kind of had to be the puppet in this. We're not going to fall on the sword with you, Kenny. That's you're on your own. <laughs> but I, mean, I, I think when you look at it, it's, it's kind of like the perfect storm. So the Van Winkles have the face where everyone knows Pappy and everybody wants to get Pappy. And that's, you know, that's, I, I'll, step out and say that's a majority of what was being sold and traded and everything on the secondary market. It helps when you have a billion dollar company that also hates the secondary behind you. And that's, that's where Sazerac came in. So, you know, where I think Preston said where he fell, which was, you know, he hated the secondary market and all this stuff, but um, where Julian and everyone else falls, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, to me, and I, I just think it's really misguided is, is the best way. I don't want to say it's dumb or stupid because I think they have their reasons. Um, but I think they miss out on they're actually targeting their their biggest, you know, cheerleaders and their biggest promoters by going after the secondary market. Um, and, you know, to go after the secondary market and not just put some, you know, anti-counterfeiting measures on their bottle um, I think that's the biggest thing. And I have a, you know, my, my prop is in the background of how much I feel like they actually do care about the consumer. And you, you know, you look at the 2017 Pappy 15 year, they put the wrong foil cap. They put the red cap on the bottle instead of the black cap and just let it go out to market. I mean, I can't think of any other product where they put the wrong cap on and just be like, eh, who cares? Send it. Like, <laughs> no, one will notice. You'll you know, anyway. no, no big deal. And, and that's to me, that was like a bigger slap in the face than actually going after the secondary. The fact that, you know, these things are how crazy people go. And it wasn't like there was a press announcement before. It was just like they started popping up and people were like, hey, the 15 years got a red cap on it this year. Like, oh, bottling mistake. It's good. Um, so it took us 20,000 bottles before we realized that we're like, yeah, screw it, I mean, let it go. Like I just, you know, we send one sticker out wrong and you're going to get a reply automatically. You send it out. Hey, sorry, you send the wrong sticker, whatever. Um, so that to me was just kind of like, what are we really going after here? And there ultimately, Sazerac, Sazerac's defense of the three tier system, which they are strongly embedded in. They believe in the three tier system. They think the three tier system should be ne- there no matter what. And they see the secondary market as, uh, you know, a deterrent to the three tier system or, you know, impeding the three tier system. And ultimately it's not about taking down the secondary. It's about making sure that that three tier system is in place and ongoing forever. They were even against like the, the Vintage Spirits uh, Act yep. that passed in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, uh, for me, like that's what the secondary market was, was to go and enjoy looking at those beautiful old bottles that would occasionally pop up from the fifties and sixties. I gave two shits about Pappy and, you know, but that's what led the conversation and it really, it, it comes down to, it comes down to every single year, uh, for, for that company, they have the hottest, uh, bourbons that everybody wants in every major city in the country and the small ones in every country in the world. How do they get there? How do they get it there? And then in between those, these things that happen, there's theft within their own company. Um, you know, there's small little counterfeiters here and there. Um, you got ridiculous hype, you know, driving around it, uh, like from like the, from the fortune story about billionaires can't even get a bottle to, um, hell us talking about it. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, I've, the, my whole Pappy versus the field thing on YouTube was, was an experiment for me just to have some fun with it. But, but it was like, you know, I'm part of the problem. And so I guess, um, you know, before we kind of jump into some other questions here, does anybody else kind of think that, you know, was it really like, why make the Van Winkles the face of this? With a career as a master distiller spanning almost 50 years, as well as a Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Famer and having over 100 million people taste his products, Steve Nally is a legend of bourbon who for years made Maker's Mark with expertise and precision. His latest project is with Bardstown Bourbon Company, 
a state-of-the-art distillery in the heart of the bourbon capital of the world. They're known for their popular Fusion series. However, they're adding something new in 2020 with a release named The Prisoner. It starts as a nine-year-old Tennessee bourbon that is then finished in The Prisoner Wine Company's French oak barrels for 18 months. The good news is, is you don't have to wait till next year to try it. Steve and the team at Bardstown Bourbon Company have teamed up with Rackhouse Whiskey Club. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Their December box, which will ship in time for Christmas, features a full-size bottle of Bardstown's Fusion Series and a 200 milliliter bottle of The Prisoner. There's also some cool merch inside, and as always, with this membership, shipping is free. Get your hands on some early release Bardstown bourbon by signing up at rackhousewhiskeyclub.com. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. 291 Colorado Whiskey aims to create a one-of-a-kind, bold and beautiful Colorado Whiskey. Rugged, refined, rebellious. Distillery 291 is an award-winning, small-batch whiskey distillery located in Colorado Springs, Colorado, nestled in the shadow of Pikes Peak. Owner and founding distiller Michael Myers grew up on the family farms in Georgia and Tennessee, across the countryside defined by rolling hills, horses, and whiskey. He set out to create a flagship whiskey that evoked the Wild West, a cowboy walking to a bar saying, give me a whiskey, and the bartender slamming down a bottle, a bottle of 291 Colorado whiskey. Find a bottle near you at 291coloradowhiskey.com. Ride it like you stole it, drink it like you own it. Live fast, drink responsibly. Like, why make the Van Winkles the face of this? Like, does anybody else have a kind of theory about behind that? Well, I mean, do you think that Sazerac is making the Van Winkles the face, or do you think the Van Winkles are recognizing that of their own volition and, and you know, driving it as well themselves? This is all theory, man. So if you think that, you know, they had the wheels in motion behind this and they're just like, hey, Preston, we're going to go ahead and let you be the punching bag this today. Like, what, what do, you, do you really think that was it? Or do you really think that maybe the Van Winkles actually do legitimately care about the secondary market? I think they were the face no matter what. I mean, if Four Roses came out and tried to do the same thing, it's like, well, you know, you, you, the small batch limited edition gets flipped a little bit, but um, and nobody's going to step up from a bottle from 1950, you know, some old Stitzel Weller, so nobody's going to step up and like try to shut it down on their behalf. So I think they were just kind of already the face. But. I don't think anyone else really I guess could be the face in a sense of, you know, if you think about, it is a very family business in a way, you know, if, if you look at, if you look at Sazerac and that company, you know, that, that uh, teaming up with the Van Winkles, that partnership was a fantastic move, you know, for their product line, you know, that whatever caused Van Winkle and Peppy Van Winkle, you know, all the, the things that, you know, you, you look at the dominoes that fell, years ago that just caused the popularity to skyrocket, you know, there's no question that that's overflowed into, you know, a lot of Sazerac's products. And now we've got this, you know, we've got this, this kind of like beast that's feeding itself in a way, because we've got us as, as bourbon enthusiasts, as, as drinkers who talk about this stuff all the time, who mm-hmm. buy the stuff and want the stuff. I mean, I look in my, in my, in my collection here and I've, I've definitely got like a high, percentage of Sazerac type products that I've kind of like stocked up on just based on that. Geez, I don't think I'm going to see it again for a while. I better buy a few of them as opposed to, yeah, I see it all the time. I'll just get one. I, what do I need? Three, four, you know? And so then we've got the distributors using it to hold over the retailers as a product to buy more products. And it's not just Sazerac products, but it's stuff they want to move as well because they're in it to make money, you know? Um, you know, so you've, and then you've got the retailers who don't put this stuff on the shelves. So no matter how much they're making, it appears to be a ghost, whatever it might be, even though there might be a lot of it because if a retailer is holding it back and taking you by, you know, by the, by the shoulder and saying, by the arm and saying, Hey, I got something in special. You're a, you're a good guy. I like you. You want it. You're suddenly saying I am special. I do want that. Absolutely. And then it's not even a question about it, you know, so got everybody really believing that all these products are insanely hard to get that's causing people to hoard them, stockpile them and buy more of them. And then that's what's causing the price to go up. So the secondary in a way has kind of helped their cause in a sense, you know, at the same time, you know, it's they're they're a company, you know, you got to look at, say, what are you doing to stop 
you know, uh, counterfeit bottles to stop these things from going on to prevent illegal activity, you know, so how much of it is them really wanting to stop it versus just, okay, I suppose we really should, you know, apply and make it look like we're doing something over here. Nick, I think it's more than just that it, that helped them. I mean, it's the horse they rode. It's the, it's the reason that those brands are as popular as they are today. And now they're at least facially turned their, their back on that secondary market, but that's, that's what made them. And maybe once you make it that big, you can turn your back on it and you can try to take this holier than thou attitude toward it, but it, it got them there. And I mean, maybe it'll push them back down if they, if they push back against it too. You hard. know, Corky Taylor uh, from Peerless, uh, when I asked him about this, you know, at Bourbon and Beyond, he, he said that he's like this, he's like, it's a mistake that this whole thing was like uh, punishing the the hardcore consumers that really has brought you know bourbon to where it's at right now but i'm telling you all the van winkles in the 90s every single day they were near closure you know that that that's a company where um everybody wants to hate on them but it was I mean, they had a long ro- uh long road to get here and you know and they they get probably far more hate mail hate mail than all of us combined uh on on a yearly basis because people can't get bottles and they get all these stories that are connected to them and so i think a lot of uh, what we caught on that stage in september was frustration and i don't think sazer i don't think i don't think sazerag put the van winkles up to this i think they wanted to do it. And I think Preston on that stage that day wanted to get it off his chest. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, they, they're angry about it. They're angry about the fact that someone can sell a bottle that, that that's, who is not a licensed retailer. They're also angry about the people who are uh, jacking up prices in liquor stores. And here's the thing is they say they can't do anything about that. that that's true. So the liquor stores who are price gouging you know, are protected by federal laws that prevent prevent alcohol companies uh, from dictating pricing. So, like Mac and these like and Bose, they they like fix their prices and prices and retailers can't can't do they, they can't jack their prices up. Alcohol cannot do that, and that all goes back to the '40s and '50s. And ironically, the Pappy Van Winkle testified in Congress talking about uh, all the price fixing that was going on. Uh, in the industry. So they're in a hard spot. And I, I, you know, it, it's, it's a no win. It's a no win. If they jack up their prices to kind of like, you know, meet the demand, they're in trouble. You know, they get yelled at, you know, and if they don't do anything, they get, they get yelled at. But, but what it came down to is they made a business decision and, and they, I think, I don't think they made the best business decision, but that they made what they thought was best for their company. Fred, to piggyback on that, you know, I, I think that they do in, internalize what they went through. And I think there's got to be a part of them that says, if we raise our prices today, this, you know, we've kind of gotten lucky in a way. I mean, if I were them, I would certainly feel like, man, we, we really got lucky over the years with how popular our product has become. What if we push it too hard and we lose what we've gained and we're back to where we were? You yeah. Know, so I, I got to believe if you're them, that's got to be going on. I mean, it's a human thing to feel. I would think if any of us in that position would probably be, you know, thinking the same thing. You know, and this is this is all kind of coming back around because, uh, you know, Christopher Hart and a few other people with inside the chat, you know, they were saying like, oh, it's all the Van Winkles. It's not Sazerac. And, and I'm kind of saying I'm kind of the opposite. And I'll kind of give you my my theory on this, because, you know, when I look at this, I look at, you know, the Van Winkles is the face of this and they come out saying that the main argument is behind counterfeiting. And that's a pretty weak excuse. Like actually it's a shitty excuse in my opinion, like, because they're not doing anything to prevent it. Um, they're not doing anything to uh, invest in it, to make anything happen. I mean, Blake made a pretty good example about that. Even quality control at Sazerac was poor enough to even see that happen. And what was the real point of just going after the secondary market? So if I think about this and I think a few steps back and I think a little bit higher up the ladder, I'm like, okay, well, 
I want to put these people to face it because they're the most popular brand out there. And it's something that people are going to recognize. And if it's coming from them, all these bourbon nerds can go crazy. They're going to talk about it. And people are talking already on, on here that's saying, you know, we're doing it. Like we're giving them the more press that they're already going to get. Right. So we're giving them free marketing. And this is uh, another theory that I, I kind of heard from somebody else as well is that Sazerac's expanding. I mean, they've got more warehouses coming out. They've got more distilleries coming online. And the goal behind this is to not have so much focus being on just a few select brands. Instead, what they want to be able to do is they want to be able to try to spread the pie even further and get these hands and get these bottles in the hands of, of more people, not the allocated products, but the stuff that's coming online. And you got to be able to get it in such a way that people aren't just talking about the same five bottles all the time. Now, I also kind of look at this uh, in another way is that this is a, this is a very bad thing for bourbon because, you know, Fred talked about it a little bit earlier. And, and I think we've all had that same feeling that when we're able to sit there and we're able to scroll and we're able to see these cool bottles from the 50s and old Willer antiques from the 70s and like all these like, uh, you know, old will it wax tops and people are just going, you know, they're going crazy for it. And they just want to rip it away for why? For counterfeiting? Like that's bullshit. Like it's bullshit, right? There's got to be something that's a little bit, a little bit higher here to make this a real, a real claim and a real excuse, and it can't be counterfeiting. So I'm just saying that there's, there's some dots in my head that aren't connecting to make it say that counterfeits are really the real angle here. When the attorney generals uh, uh, for the country, uh, all the states basically issued uh, a joint letter saying that they were going to be cracking down on. Uh, Secondary market. That's not the Van Weekles guys. I'm sure Julian has some connections, but for to get you know, <laughs> 47 out of the 50 attorney generals. And uh, let me tell you, they're all playing on that da- the Dominican Republic mini bar stuff, and uh, the wholesaler world. Boy, they seize that opportunity better than you know, it, yeah, anything since prohibition. I mean, my God. <laughs> They're like, oh, see, look what happens here when we allow shipping. You could die. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could die from alcohol poisoning, and vultures will be eating your guts on the beach. It's just uh, ridiculous uh, how far they took that. I, I, I don't think Sazerac really gives a shit. As whiskey geeks, we think we, they care, these whiskey brands care about what we think and like what these really high end bottles matter. The, the, the reality is, those things are like 5% of their business. It's like low on the total bone. It's more of a pain they ask for them. They're thinking more grander, bigger. I just don't think that counterfeiting or the Van Winkle, I mean, yes, they want it, but I just don't think they would put all these resources in it into that when they're just, their eyes on how much fireball, how much Buffalo Trace can we push out there and, and do it globally? Not that That's what they're focused on, I think. Yeah, I think if anything, it's a reaction. I got to agree with that too, Ryan. And the Van Winkles, it may be more internal. You know, they're invested in it. But yeah, with- I think I think the Van Winkles. It's like Fred said, they've got so much sweat equity and all this, and you know, it's it's their family history, and they're just, for lack of a better term, butt hurt about it. Um, you know, that people can flip it on the market for ten x what they, you know, because a three hundred dollar bottle, they're probably making, you know. 90 to a hundred bucks on it, you know, and then, and then it's selling for 15, 18, $2,000. I mean, you know, that's probably more of it for me, but, but okay. So here's the thing, like they can control that. Why don't they do it? Well, they could, I guess, but sure. They, they can just, why don't they sell it for two grand? Get the same amount of hate from the other side <laughs> saying, well, you sold out, you they, know, they I saw what bookers do when they raise it $20. They're like, hell, fuck that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, mean I, I kind of <laughs> get it from their this nonsense. Yeah. Their perspective, you know, they, I can't imagine the amount, you know, as Fred said, they probably get the amount of hate mail, all of us combined on a daily basis. Um, you know, it's probably pretty frustrating to get like, they think they're doing the right thing by just keeping the prices lower. And I'm sure every random you know, guys email them saying, oh, I used to buy your bottles for $50 a bottle and loved it. Now I can't get it. And you got to, you know, I'm sure it's millennial thrown in there somewhere who's ruining it or like, a, you know, a guy in skinny jeans and a flannel shirt's probably the reason why they can't buy Pappy anymore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they're probably frustrated with that. Like I would be too. I, I don't, you know, I don't blame them, but I just think they're 
taking the wrong approach. <laughs> Doesn't keeping that bottle at ninety dollars encourage secondary flipping? You know, but indirectly, so, so if yeah. they increase it, so so say they came out next year and Pappy Fifteen was just five hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, I guarantee you they'd get even more hate because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, but I could be wrong. I, I mean, ultimately, I, you know, I think it, l- like Ryan said, this is not a big, I, I think all these limited releases is something they want to get behind them. You know, that we, Jordan and I toured heaven Hill and it was crazy. The amount of spirits that were flowing through there and bourbon was I mean, we saw way more watermelon vodka and flavored rums and all this stuff that we had never seen. Just, you know, hundreds of thousands of cases moving through there. Elijah Craig 23 year was not even on the radar of what was what was important and what was, you know, kind of moving the profit and loss statement. So I think it is kind of that necessary evil. They want they want to have it. They want that, you know the history and the heritage and everything else. But at the end of the day, that's not what makes these places profitable. For raising prices really, I mean, will it raise no. prices and it still, you know, flips for double for, or, you know, instantly. But will it, will it has a little bit because will it, that, that affects the bottom line a little bit more. You know, if, if you double the price of something that is affecting your bottom line by like 0.05%, oh, it's, you know. it's only one to 2% of their total business. Like, that yeah. they, they cut almost all their gift shop sales of it because it became such a pain in the ass. They were getting ABC letters from people saying like, or not from people, but from the ABC, um, that people were turning them in, you know, saying like, well, they're just selling to certain people. And, you know, they're, then they're like, well, the hell with it. We're not even going to deal with it anymore. Cause it's, yeah. we just do this for the, you know, the whiskey enthusiast it's turned into more headache than, than it needs to be. So I want to bring something up that Kenny said at the very top, and that's like I want everyone to know like how hard we work to get a representative from Sazerac to come on and talk about this. And we thought we had someone across the finish line, but we did not uh, say, "Hey, uh, come on this show." You know, we respected that person's uh, position and his future with uh, with that respective company. And I just want to tell you that. Anytime and we have, we've all given a lot, we've slung a lot of things Heaven Hill's way. And anytime I have ever written anything negative about Heaven Hill, they reach out to me and they explain. Anytime I've ever written anything about Jim Beam, uh, they reach out to me and explain. And, you know, sometimes they won't talk to me for six months, but they will, they will still have a conversation with me. What we are looking at here, we are looking at uh, a, a very, a very closed in organization arguably it's the best whiskey that's out there and hungry consumers who want to know more. And if anyone from Sazerac's listening, I'm just telling you that the playing it, like playing the game of like not talking about this is only hurting you is only hurting you. And, and you got to come on, you got to talk about this because people, people are fascinated about it from a business perspective as well. I mean, in addition to Kenny's like, right vein popping up over here when he's got a blood draw tomorrow you know i'm getting concerned about him uh people are absolutely fascinated with the business of bourbon so let's talk about one of the most key issues in our industry and that is allocation how do you decide to do allocation i would i would love to have that conversation and so uh, there's one other thing I kind of want to also bring up as we were talking about raising prices in this just kind of like just jog my memory a little bit. You know, when Blake came out with his article, you know, saying that maybe there's like 5% of retailers nationwide that are actually still selling at SRP. And let's let's be let's be generous. We'll give it the 80-20 rule. We'll say 20% of retailers nationwide are still selling at SRP. Even if they've jacked well, how up. Well, your state run? You've got state run to start with, right? Okay. Still so that, that's, that's so, all them. And then you've got the other ones with a lot of big retailers are doing lotteries across yeah. the board. Even if they said, okay, well, guess what? The new SRP for Pappy 15 is 500 bucks. There's still 80% of the country that's still going to charge more than 500 bucks. It's fine. Right. And, and the 20% that's there. Yeah, sure. They'll bitch, but whatever. Like, I think most people get over it. And, and not only that is most people, if they have the offer to buy a $500 bottle, most people are going to do it anyway because that's the only time they're ever going to get their hands on it. So I don't really see a um, 
a whole lot of blowback, even if they were to raise the price on the back end. However, I've always been one to always say, you know, kudos to Sazerac and the entire portfolio of actually kind of sticking to their guns and really not raising prices across the board on any any allocated bourbon. Um, you know, so it's 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 one thing that is is cool to be the bourbon consumer and just say like, hey, it, it's always a good deal if you can find it at retail, right? If I could find the Elmer T. Lee for forty five dollars, cool, great deal. If it's one hundred and fifty, maybe it's a pass. So that's just one of the things that you know over the over the years, I'm just really surprised that we've stuck with it. And kind of like the last question I want to throw uh, as regards to this, do you all think other distilleries are happy with Sazerac's actions here or Van Winkle's actions, whoever it is, to actually take down this uh, this singular, or should I say the big secondary market groups? I, I think that's an, an even more interesting question because so far nobody has jumped on board to publicly say, yeah, we're with them. We should, you know, be doing something to combat that. And maybe it is because, you know, if we look at it, Sazerac are the leading products in the majority of that. You know, it's it's dusty bottles and it's Sazerac products. Um, but I do think it's interesting that nobody is really kind of jumping to fight the battle with them. Um, and you know whether that's because they disagree or whether that's because they want to see how it, you know, the consumer is going to react. I don't know, but um, the, the longer other distilleries stay out of that fight, I think it's better for the consumer. Well, I think here in the United States, you know, I think the market is just very, very small, relatively speaking. You know, maybe there's counterfeiting going on in other countries where it's more of a massive problem that we're just not in tune with that we don't know. You know, you see videos pop up on YouTube of these like mass production type situations where people are bottling, you know, something in a, in a counterfeit nature that it definitely appears to be in a different country, you know, where it's going to be, you know, sold in some black market. Uh, but here in the United States, you know, I think it's really resolved mostly to the enthusiast crowd, you know, to the crowd that's trying to stock bars and restaurants and high end places like that, um, you know, as a percentage of sales, I, it's got to be really small. What I would really like to see, and I know, you know, I know producers, distilleries listen to this, I would like to see a movement from producers and distilleries, you know, from somewhere to kind of create this market. How do we, you know, People are going to buy and sell. They're going to, it's, this stuff is going to change hands. It's going to happen. You know, the market is going to find a way because somebody has it, somebody else wants it, plain and simple. That's just how it's going to work, right? So if it's not this thing, it's going to be the next thing. So I would like to see a movement to get behind that, you know, in a way that doesn't encroach on the new production, the new business, the stuff that does go through the three tier system the normal way, there's plenty that doesn't, you know, there's plenty of stuff like Fred mentioned, you know, the older stuff, the stuff people find in their grandparents' basements that somebody else wants that is of no value to the person who found it, but of tremendous value to maybe somebody else. And in some cases, maybe a lot of other people, you know, as we've seen with these charity auctions and things of that nature, where these bottles can raise a tremendous amount of money, there's certainly a market for it. And I really believe you know, the producers, especially the big producers should get behind that kind of, you know, if they're behind the culture, if they're, you know, touting the history and those kinds of things, put your money where your mouth is and make it so that we can have that market that everybody wants and it's going to have anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, what's funny is there was a secondary market called the classified ads forever. Like, uh, and through my research, I found so many bottles for sale and like small newspapers and people would just, you know, go and, and buy them. But I'll say this, like Christopher Hart brought this up. Ryan and I were on his show. It'll be, I think it airs this week as well. But I, I brought up the fact that I do think that second, you know, he brought up the fact is like the secondary market is, will always survive in, in these forums in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not believe that I am seeing uh, an uptick of federal authorities getting involved with this. I mean, this is a very serious issue. The same people who were involved in, in taking down uh, big tobacco in the 1990s, you're starting to see them focus on alcohol, while at the same time, you have a uh, an incredible large movement within the health community to try and ban advertising. So the second the all this alcohol stuff falls under kind of like two battles. One you have one trying, you know, one side trying to block illegal sales, and you have another side, you know, for whatever reason they're trying to block illegal sales. On the other side. You have people who are trying to ban alcohol and social media. So you've got 
I mean, it, right now it's coming at two fronts. And in some ways, that's why it's kind of Mark Brown's head has always been a very, he's always been very conservative about this. And so if like, if you were to put yourself in, in, in his shoes of like, you're trying to protect uh, what you do protect your company in the best way you think is possible, you know, you may pursue something like this to prevent it. Uh, but the fact is, is what no one ever seems to grasp is that us, the bourbon fan, the consumer, you know, I, I just feel like all of these, if anything is, is going to change, it has to come from us. You know, there was a few years ago, New York tried to ban fantasy, uh, fantasy gaming, you know, within five hours, every Senator in New York had heard from people in their area that had never even considered politics and they changed it just like that. Now we can all play fantasy football and make money off of it. So if, if we are going to save any you know semblance of what the secondary market is or what it meant to us, it's got to come from us and we have to start like pushing it. We have to like, you know, write our congressmen and, and our state senators and say like, you know, this is an issue that's important to us. And believe it or not, you know, if Wade Woodard and people like that multiply, I mean, who can handle 20 letters from Wade Woodard today? <laughs> <laughs> and Fred, I go bigger than that. I mean, the, the three tier system is antiquated. It's rooted in prohibition era sentiments and, and law. I mean, that whole the whole system's got to go. And if part of that is a more even more robust vintage spirits law than we already have that really resembles what the secondary market looks like, so be it. It'll be a safer market if folks like Sazerac and the other producers uh, take anti counterfeiting measures. It'll be a safer market. We've got to go to more. Uh, I mean, I'm always an open market guy, but here I, I really am for partly out of self interest, but. That's where we've got to go. We've got to go to to less regulation and, and more openness on it. Yeah. yeah. Let's stage let's stage a DC protest. Hey, hey, three tiers gotta go. I don't know, however that goes. <laughs> Get the go, go to DC and drink bourbon. <laughs> yeah. Next to the 30 other picketers. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> what would happen is everybody would just end up at Jack Rose and no one would go do anything. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> We'd meet some uh, members of Congress while we were there though. Yeah, a guy yeah. with a retail license in DC, so we could maybe set something up. I think. Oh yeah, let's right. do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ryan, you get the RV. Let's go gas it up. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead. We'll kind of wrap this up on a little bit higher note because this is this is the Thanksgiving episode. So happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Hope you're uh, if you're if you're driving, you're uh, maybe you're just uh, starting to trying to fall asleep to some trip to fan lifting us or something mm -hmm. like that, but. Let's go ahead and kind of go around a little bit and kind of talk about, you know, what we're thankful for in bourbon in 2019. If there's something that, that was awesome that happened to you, um, whether it was growing or doing anything like that or just landing a cool bottle. Let's hear it. Like in height? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Why not? In width. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, so... First, I'm going to plug an article that's coming this week. <laughs> no, so Bourbon are always doing an article about, you know, just Thanksgiving, open up the good bottles. Like, who cares if it has a secondary market? I think that's even more prevalent now that the secondary market is kind of fading and or, or unstable. So what I always try to do is open up good bottles with family members, friends, that kind of stuff. Um I will be opening up a Pappy 15 year. Um, that that'll be a part of it. No, I think you know Thanksgiving's great. It, it's time to you know kind of reflect a little bit. And um, so, I, I, all in all, this has been a good year for bourbon. I think there's a whole lot more great available products on the market. Um, you know, we're starting to hit a little bit of that. You know, people are have been scaling up for you know six seven years now. So we're seeing more and more great products come on the market and yeah, it's a good thing. Absolutely. All right. Well, here, I'll go real quick. So, um, you know, at least for us in the podcast, you know, I'm thankful for the success that we've had this year. Uh, it's been fantastic. You know, we've had a lot of great episodes and, and not only that, as I also, and I selfishly have to give a shout out to our Patreon community because, you know, we are now, uh, 11 months into the year, uh, being able to take my wife away from her old job and have her 
work on the podcast full time. So they can fight more. Holy cow. <laughs> it's all it is fight. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's civil. It's very civil. But no, I mean, it really has been. It's been a blessing, uh, again, for myself and the family and everything like that. So that's ultimately what I'm, what I'm thankful for in regards to this podcast, in regards to bourbon. Uh, for this year, just really what it's brought me. I, and I'm going to echo that. I mean, we took some shit when on the round table, when we did the, uh, the, the shutdown of the secondary market and everyone doubted it because there was only one email at the time or whatever the hell it is. You guys took some grief uh, a couple weeks ago for the episode of, of the counterfeiter, but you guys bring so much uh, good to the bourbon world. And I appreciate that. And that goes for bourboner and, and breaking too. I mean, you guys, I'm sitting here with the three groups that are really leading the charge. So I, I'm thankful for that. The other thing I'm, I'm thankful for is still the generosity of the bourbon community, whether it's sharing a, a rare bottle or sending samples or those sorts of things, or doing a big event like uh, Ryan and, and Fred are aware of, and we're with me uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and you get you get three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in in donations for bottles of bourbon and for barrels. And I was just at another uh, charitable event this past weekend for a children's hospital, where you would think that there would be where there's doctor money in the crowd and and great auction items. They had a house, they had a BMW, all these sorts of things, and it was two hundred eighteen thousand dollars. So the the generosity of the bourbon community is something that has always struck me and that I'm, that I'm thankful for and thankful to be a part of. You know, and 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 thank you for that that comment too, Brian. Um, you know, I'll kind of rewind a little bit. You know, so Jordan, Eric, and I we met in the second grade. Uh, Jordan lived down the street from me. Eric uh, went to the same school. You know, we were friends since then. Uh, but then college, I went to different places. You know, after college, I lived in different places. Um, incidentally, Jordan lived in Louisville, Kentucky for a little while. And when he was there, we'd visit, we'd go drink bourbon. We'd go to distilleries, that kind of thing. Well, it didn't really cl- quite click. Uh, he left there, moved somewhere else. Well, you know, so we really honestly weren't talking that often. We might talk once every couple months, see each other once or twice a year, if that. Um at one point we got together and we each had like 10 bottles of bourbon. We were talking about a little bit. We, we each went and bought way too much and brought it all. And we had this gigantic tasting years ago. And that's what kind of kicked off the idea for doing the website and kind of going from there. And that got us to the point where now, you know, we're on a chat together, but pretty much talking every day um, on the chat and then probably talking on the phone, you know, once or twice a week, you know, and then that's transitioned to, you know, meeting you guys, you know, in uh, January, 2018, you know, we all get together and select a barrel, you know, and now here we are, you know, go to Kentucky, get together, you know, do this, you know, so it's just, it's really, you know, I feel like bourbon has brought me together with a lot of people in my life. Um, that's been that, you know, kind of an unintended consequence, but really, honestly, if it wasn't for that, I think, I don't think I'd have the interest in bourbon that I do have. I don't think we'd still be writing about it if we didn't have that support, if we didn't have that kind of community engagement that's around it. And then that echoes to all the people that are readers, subscribers. Honestly, even if you just comment on an Instagram post, it doesn't matter. It's just that like that communication, that interaction with people that it seems to inspire is really what I think supports. It supports us for what we do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, whatever. And I think that that idea of bourbon bringing everybody together is really what makes it keep going and what makes me keep being excited about it. Nick, you're on um, fire tonight. You've like, no, it's a little, it is a little warm in here. <laughs> I got, I got chills there. Um, that's you know, how I, I feel. I, I mean, really, truly, I mean, it, that is how I feel. I mean, it's, it's just great that, you know, we connect on this level and it, and it's just great that the ball kind of keeps rolling and just, it, it keeps getting bigger and people keep getting excited about it. You know, it's like, you don't want that to go away. You know, you don't, you don't want it to be a plateau that drops off. You want it to, to really keep going, you know, and, and, and growing. So I started writing about bourbon, you know, in 2006 and I was a definitely a consumer prior to that. And, you know, I tell this story a lot, but I was writing about wine at the same time. And I, I really, I really had made it as a wine writer. Like I had broke some things and, uh, I was writing for Spectator and wine enthusiasts. I had made it, 
and and bourbon was still kind of like 2008 to 2012 if you're a writer you couldn't really do much with it there were a couple of blogs but there was not really a way i could support my family writing about it so like i was writing about like technology and wine was really kind of taking off and in 2012 i was uh, a finalist for the international wine writer of the year uh the louis rotor awards for like the under 35 category and I'm in this room in London with like Robert Parker and Jancis Robinson, and all these legendary wine critics and winemakers. And I look around this room and all I thought to myself was, I just want to be with Jimmy Russell. I want to be with Fred No and Parker Beam and Lincoln Henderson. And I just, I want to talk about bourbon. It was, it was that moment in that room that I decided I wanted to leave wine and focus on uh, bourbon. And so I kind of just threw up, put all my cards into, uh, in, into bourbon in, in 2012. And it's been one of the greatest decisions I ever made. Um, but I could not do it without, without the support of my family. I mean, what I do is I travel a lot. My wife is absolutely amazing, even though she steals most of my good bourbon when I'm out of town. <laughs> true story she's always making whiskey sours with like something that i spent a lot of money on to include rare vintage bottles so i got to figure out how to hide those better but if it wasn't for her i mean i would have given up a long time ago and if you've ever read one of my books or a blog post or liked anything i love you man i really appreciate it but i'm also really thankful for ryan and kenny like you all, you all um, listening, you know, we, we kind of go back and forth and everything, but I feel like we've really, we've really become pretty good friends in the past year. And that counterfeiting, um, that counterfeiting episode, we really bonded over that. And I take, I take 100% of all the criticism that came from that because I did feel I came off very unprofessional uh, because I mostly wanted to strangle the guy's neck and it came off pretty obviously. And I didn't let Ryan and Kenny get a lot of their questions in. And, and you know what? They were just like, we're a team, we're a team, we're a team. And so I'm really thankful for those two knuckleheads. You got it, Fred. Yeah, but back at you. There's a, but there's an important question that Jason Nutter wants to know, and is that, are you thankful for vodka? <laughs> breakingvodka.com Fred we wrote it for you <laughs> thankful there's something to hate out there yeah you know what it, I, I really do I really do think it's important to hate something in social media uh, most people hate on a politician I hate vodka so <laughs> fair enough <laughs> alright I guess that leaves me huh second that Fred I've been extremely grateful for this relationship you know us jo you joining the team i think it's been an incredible ride and you've given us opportunities that i still can't even like wrap my head around like me being a host or kenny and i being a host of emceeing bourbon panels at a major rock festival and you look out in the crowd and there's like thirty thousand to fifty thousand people and i'm just like so grateful the opportunities you've given us and um given us Metallica concerts like we're five rows from the from like what's his name the Napster killer dude and <laughs> um you know we're by these like hardcore fans and Kenny and I are in like our Patagonia jackets we look so awkward <laughs> and like, it was such an awesome time though and like just I'm so grateful for everything you've done for us and I'm so grateful for Kenny and Lauren and everything they've done for this show. I mean, this was my idea, but I could never have envisioned it being what it is. It's insane. We have people, a great Patreon community that just continues to support us and continues to grow. And it's, and they come on barrel picks, whether they come off, you know, to liquor stores to meet us, they come in and I don't take that for granted ever. It's surreal. And I'm like humbled by it. And I just, I, I just so thankful that, Kenny and Lauren and Fred have been involved to take this to where it has. And then the bourbon community, the round table, I mean, the relationships we build, I mean, Holy cow. I mean, like you guys hanging out with you all at the festivals, doing the picks, like 
it's just so much fun. And like the bond that we have together, it's, it's just words cannot describe how much great has happened in this, this podcast that I dreamed of when I was driving down in between jobs of spring lawns. And now it's this. <laughs> and so I just want to say thank you to everyone. And I'm just so thankful for it all. And I hope it never goes away. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I do love like having us as a group of guys and friends that, you know, we can all get together and we're not like, so how's your day job? Like we don't ever ask that, you know, <laughs> wait, everyone has day job. What's your real job? <laughs> That's what you actually do to feed your family. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, again, thank you uh, everybody for coming on the round table tonight and, and talking, you know, I think we had a, a good list of questions. Uh, you know, Sazerac, if you're out there, we're always let, willing to let somebody come on and, and kind of, we'd love to have the transparency out there. I think, uh, I think the community really wants to hear from you. And I think, uh, I think, I think everybody would really just love to be able to kind of hear, as Fred said, the business side of it as well. Uh, and then also, again, thank you to everybody that joined us in chat. Uh, I think we had a close to around 83 concurrent viewers was peak is where we were. So that's awesome. I didn't hit 100, but we got close. Have a great, happy Thanksgiving. And we will see everybody next week. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.